no kotarani me ingari hi o kutipuna i tipu a ke ahau ki te whenua o Ngāti ka hungunu ki hera taunga, kei te noho ahau ki te whenua o te āti awa ki te upoko o te ikau Māui, Corvette Crockford tōku ingoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome everybody who has joined us to episode 9 of Te Aho Tā Huhu, the Progressive Home Ownership webinar series. You're joining us for Managing the Build. I'm Vic Crockford, the Chief Executive at Ngā Whariro o Aotearoa, Community Housing Aotearoa, and I have the absolute privilege of being your kai whakahaere for this episode. With a husband who's a builder and parents in the trades, I really do feel like it's meant to be. As a reminder, this series is produced by Te Matapihi in partnership with Te Tuapapa Kurakainga, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. And we're here with the purpose of helping housing providers and whānau engage successfully with the Progressive Home Ownership Fund. Before we get into our speaker presentations, let's join together in karakia. Whakatakatahau ki te uru. Whakatakatahau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta. Kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hi ake ana te atakura, e tio, e huka, e hauhu, te hei Māori ora. Well, Māori ora, everybody. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our kaikōrero, our speakers for today. We've got Paura Sharon from Sharon Associates, Ingrid Downey from Dwell Housing Trust, and Nick Green from Habitat for Humanity. Right. That's enough from me. Let's get the concrete slab poured and make a start on managing the build with Paura Sharon, who's going to speak to us about the development and construction of Papakainga. Welcome, Paura. Uh, kia, ora, kia ora, Victoria. Tēnā koe. Uh, tēnā koe i whaka tuwhirai tā tātane kaupapa o te rā nau te karaki tuku nā rira uh, Nau te, te ara i para, tēnā koe, tēnā ano hoki koe i whakatau mai i a tātou i raru i te manakitanga o tēnei kaupapa, uh, nei rā te mihi atu kia koe, uh, o te rāna koutou e whakarite nei i tēnei kaupapa whakahirihira, uh, tēnā koutou ki ora tātou. A ko wai tēnei, a ko Paura Sharon tōku ingoa, uh, no Ngāti Kahununu me Ngāti Pāhauera, uh, ko rākau tātahi me te rongo ātahu ngā marai, uh, ko puera kairanga, ko whatu mā kairaro a tihei Māori ora. Kia ora, tēnā koutou e, e whakarongo mai ana, e mātakitaki mai ana, uh, e are are mai ana o koutou nga taringa. Ka pai. Oh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, Paul Sheeran, Sheeran Associates, based in uh, Hastings, Hawke's Bay. Uh, we facilitate papakainga process, and we've been fortunate and lucky enough to be involved in a number of cool projects, which I want to sort of highlight some of those today. But my I guess today I want to just share a high level overview of a papakainga development process, including the, the different uh, stages within and some of the things that, or a lot of most of the things that are included in there. But it's a very high level overview within a 10 to 12 minute uh, time slot. So um, I'll get into it straight away. Um, so basically when we're building Papakainga, uh, we're creating intentional communities. This is a Papakainga that we did down in the Wairarapa Hurunuyo at Hurunuyo Rangi Marae. And um, yeah, so they built six rental properties on their marae. So they're recreating their community around their marae. So essentially that's what uh, the whanau are looking to achieve back on their ancestral lands. So managing a papakainga development uh, basically includes three, uh, three to four different stages. Um, we have the pre-feasibility study stage, which we uh, we sit down with the whanau and that's where we talk about whanau, whenua and the whare, the whare being the actual process of, of the papakainga development and what it wants to look like afterwards. 
Um, so that's the pre-feasibility, and then we would help the final apply for some funding, and then we would move into the feasibility study process, which is uh, fully funded by Tipuni Kōkiri. However, we'll get into how things have changed in the last 12 months around that. Feasibility study generally takes around nine to 12 months. Then we move into, then we submit another application for development, uh, which includes infrastructure and construction. And that's roughly around 18 months, depending on how many houses you're, you're building in your public kind of development. And then once we walk away, obviously uh, you guys, the, the, the trustees, the whānau uh, become landlords and they've gone ongoing um, property management. So those are generally the four overview um, steps in the Papakainga process. Pre-feasibility study, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're working with the whānau, we're identifying where the whānau, uh, get the whānau all rowing in the same direction, all together on the one waka. Um, we're assessing where the land is in terms of um, district plans, what's, rel what's relative to the district plan, uh, is there an entity over the land? Do we need to establish an entity? So we're ironing out basically the, the, the two things that we want to iron out in this stage. Probably the most important as well is to ensure that the whānau are together and um, all thinking along, generally along the same lines and rowing the same way. And then we're um, looking at the whenua in terms of what we need to achieve there. So basically by the end of this process, um, we know our aspirations, we know where our land is, we know uh, if we've got an entity or if we need to uh, establish one in the Māori Land Court, because that's going to be the entity that applies for any funding. All right, so we complete that, then we help the whānau assess, or in, sorry, uh, fill out an application for feasibility stu study funding, uh, which the feasibility study includes your visioning at the front end, um, and basically that's establishing your master plan. Then we would assess the land accordingly to the master plan, which we're talking sort of topography survey, geotechnical survey. Um, we would then start putting together the application for the resource consent, um, i.e. the land use. Uh, quite often the final will get confused around resource consent and building consent. So once you've got your resource consent, you know um, what you're doing within that district plan, what you're allowed to do, and um, you can do it. We start working on the house design concept so we can overlay that onto the master plan. And then we can put together a full master plan, which is 3D, um, a re full rendered version of a master plan, which we have an example, an early example of one of ours that we can show you today. From that, we're procuring, we're financial, um, so we're costing the projects out budget-wise, what we need grant-wise, what we need to go to for the loans, and we're starting to build our financial model. Um, and basically, this is where the rubber hits the road. Is this financially viable, um, or how do we make it financially viable? Okay. And then last but not least, we're applying for the development funding and we're getting a high level approval of our finance that we need. Okay, um, we'll touch more on some of these things as we go through. This is a basic example of a master plan. So we would have done a 2D exercise, um, putting the house platforms on, putting the infrastructure in, showing the access way, and then we would have put the plans onto the T 2D and then done a rendered view. So this is an actual project that's been uh, approved here in Hawke's Bay. Um, the George and Heaney Henderson Family Trust, uh, Farno Trust on um, Farnham Road in Clive. Okay, so that's just an example of a master plan, which you would get in a feasibility study process. Okay. Then we get into the development process, which I mentioned is the 12 to 18 months. So. We've completed the feasibility study. We've submitted our application to the funders for development. We've been successful, and this is where we step into the development. So it's just giving you some ideas in terms of what actually happens in the development, i.e. earthworks, 
Um, I'm not too sure if anyone's friends with uh, Zach Mahuare on Facebook, but the two photos on the left are of the Mahui Pera Trust Papakainga out at Tehoke. Um, and Zach's very uh, heavy on social media, so you might have seen that project. And then obviously on the right, we've got the two photos. That's the Aurangi Māori Trust Board Stage 2, which is shows you the construction of the houses and how it's all coming together in the development process. The funding and finance and registration. So there's been a change this year from Tipuni Kōkiri. Um, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development is obviously involved now under the new an announcement from the government in May. Um, and now we have a Fai Kainga, Fai Oranga application process. Um, it is a new and you whereby you would submit your expressions of interest to go down the uh, Papa Kainga process, i.e., feasibility and uh, development. Obviously, with the financing, if it's Māori Free Old Land at the moment, uh, we're only dealing with Kiwi Bank and there are other banks interested watching this space, but at the moment it's just Kiwi Bank that have the Kainga Whenua alone, and obviously Kainga Ora uh, underwrites the Kainga Whenua alone. Okay, and so that's the loan security. Kainga Ora will underwrite it, and Kiwi Bank will provide the process and the um, finance for your project, and then obviously you'll have to uh, register any uh, instruments on, at the Māori Land Court, say a licence to occupy, if it's a home ownership uh, project, and determination orders and the likes of things like that. Okay, so those are the three processes there that will need to be completed. In terms of whai kainga, whai uranga funding, what does it fund? Um, I'm, we're not going to go too deep in this, but there's a list of infrastructure items that it would fund, it would look to fund, and that's for both rentals and home ownership. Generally in a papakainga development, we have um, mixed model ownership, whereby we would have some rentals owned by the trust and some whānau would be coming in as homeowners. But all infrastructure is, at the moment, is funded uh, for both rentals and home ownership, and that's the list there. For the construction costs, uh, you would there would be a percentage funded, okay? So it might be anywhere from, and it's relative to what you need, which is based off the income, i.e. the rental income um, and the operating expenses uh, once everything's developed going forward. But as you can see there, so the percentage of construction costs are relative to rental properties only. Uh, and there's a list there of some of those costs, okay? And these are all identified in what they call the Project Viability Assessment Tool, the PVAT, which Tipuni Kōkiri has developed over a number of years based off for a number of projects, and we've all had input into it. And um, yeah, so basically that covers everything off in a project. But you'll see at the bottom there, not home ownership construction costs, okay? So the construction, grant is only relative to rental properties. All right, home ownership support and finance. So obviously the infrastructure is there. Uh, you would get your Kainga Whenua loan from Kiwi Bank, and that would be underwritten by Kainga Order. Once the loan is approved by Kiwi Bank, they would then send that off to Kainga Order, who would, their lawyers would look at it, assess it against their policy, and they would then produce a tripart license to occupy agreement, uh, which the, covers the, the, the trustees or the landowners would then sign and the homeowner and the kind order uh, represented as the underwriter, okay? Uh, following on from that, um, I just want to just show you some projects that we have achieved over the years. So this is a nice little project based at Kohu Pātiki. Um, five houses, um, which includes four rentals and one home ownership. Uh, this was done on one acre. You can see on the right-hand side, the one acre. Um, and I've put this in there just to highlight what you can actually achieve on a one acre. And this whānau wanted to put as many houses on there as they could. 
and it's quite a sexy little papakainga. Um, on the left and right, two Waimarama papakaingas. Um, very fortunate to be out on the coast. So both papakainga have a view to the blue, to the ocean. And as you can see on the right-hand side one, the, they have the marae. Their marae is basically at the foothill there, so very close to their marae. And um, yeah, unlike uh, my tipuna who carried, got off the waka and carried walking inland, uh, these guys tipuna decided to camp, set camp up out at the beach. And um, so that's where they are. Uh, this is Aurangi Māori Trustboard Stage 1. This is on 8,000 square metres. Um, and we finished this one in 2015. So, and then we're on to Stage 2 um, at the moment, which is on the other side. If you can, you, you can't quite see it, but there's a little bit of uh, construction or development going on, on the left. But this is more of a wider view showing the Waipatu Marae in the top there and uh, just the wider community. Key takeaways, I think, um, definitely, uh, you need good governance st structure, good governance management through a process. The trustees need to lead this process. Um, there needs to be good fun and communication throughout the whole process. Good feedback, so there needs to be a two-way feedback. Um, and then you need good project management. Uh, whether it's within the Fano or whether it's wider, uh, whether you engage um, people like ourselves. And I want to say Tipuni Kokri are more looking at that now, uh, that they do like to see that you have some experience project management. It just saves reinventing the wheel, saves mistakes, which cost money and all that. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, there's my details there. Um, so kia ora, Victoria. Kia ora, Paura. Hey, look, we've got um, a couple of questions here that relate to timelines. So you obviously had there that you're looking at around 18 months um, for that development process, but there's a really good question that's been supported a few times around the fact that given the construction industries where it's at um, and supply chains are what they are, is it actually still taking 18 months, do you reckon, or is it taking a bit longer than that now? Absolutely. Yeah, no, it is taking longer um, and it's relative to supply. Um, but what we've experienced now, so we've moved, we've, we started as project management company and now we've moved into a housing company, construction company. Um, the suppliers are starting to catch up. Um, the two main items being exterior cladding, linear, if you're going with linear. And unfortunately, we've got an issue with jib at the moment so um good plan it just comes back to good planning and good good relationship with your suppliers kia ora paura. and the other question um here that a couple of people have have upvoted is around um the process dealing with um different agencies and of course given our partner on on this is uh is the ministry of housing and urban development we uh we fully endorse their team and in the way they work with us but but there is a question around which um is the agency that you prefer to to work with given that kaima order um to puni kōkori and the ministry of housing and urban development are, are all involved um is there one that you've worked with and built a relationship with over time so, um, you know, so Tupuni Kōkiri established the Māori Housing Network back in 2015. Um, prior to that, the money was with um, Social Housing Unit under MB, and now with the big announcement, the Tupuni Kōkiri are now partnering up with uh, Ministry Housing Urban Development. So I guess it is what it is. Um, we, we don't have a preference. Um, wherever we can get the funds to help our whānau uh, achieve their as housing aspirations. Um, I think with there being a lot more funds available for these types of projects, uh, there's, there's a lot more eyes on the bucket of money in Wellington, uh, which creates a, 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 a more stringent process. Uh, but from what I've seen, the Fai Kainga Fai Oranga process looks to be um, quite easy to navigate and quite user friendly. Great, thank you. And the final uh, question that I've I've got for you for now is, uh, what's the hardest lesson out of all of this? What's the what's the hardest one you've learned so far? 
So I, I can't uh, emphasize this uh, more, you know, that front end stuff, you know, it's not the construction, it's not development, it's that front end, Fano, kia kotahi ai te whanau, so that the whanau on the same waka, everybody knows what's, it's a, you're taking on a big project, um, and to get everybody as much as you can on that same page, take the time at the front end to do that, to communicate with the whanau and get everybody um, as much as you can rowing the same way. Kia ora, Paura. And there we have it. Upfront communication is absolutely key. Well, thank you so much for that. I know I've certainly learned a lot and, uh, and I hope that everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, we now have the pleasure of turning to Ingrid Downey from Dwell Housing Trust. Kana koutou katoa. I whanau mai o te taha o te awa o Tucson, Arizona. E raro e te maru o te manga o los rincons. E uri aho no Italy, Switzerland o northern Mexico. Ke te noho o ke whanganui atara. Ko Ingrid Downey toko enoa, tanakoto, tanakoto, tanakoto katoa. I'm honored to be a part of this webinar to represent Dwell Housing Trust in our development activities. Um, I have to recognize I'm standing on the shoulders of some amazing people. Dwell is um, uh, celebrating our 40th anniversary this year, and there have been um, to get here, it has been due to the uh, wonderful people who have been involved those 40 years and the people who are still involved. So I'd just like to recognize our uh, Chief Executive Allison and our fabulous Board of uh, Trustees um, for Dwell Housing Trust. So again, thank you for having me. Um, all right, let's get started. And let me, I'm gonna put on my glasses so I can read stuff. Oh, oh wait, sorry, these are the wrong glasses. Um, <laughs> Yeah. All right, Dwell Housing Trust. Um, yeah, new home development is only part of the story of what we do, but it's it's an exciting part. I find it um, an exciting part. That's where my heart is. Um, again, our history is our first home was purchased in 1981 in Mount Victoria. Um, and our first development wasn't until 2007, and it took till 2009 to finish, and that was in Newtown. So these things do take time to grow and come to fruition. But since then, we've made steady progress, uh, ramping up what we've been able to do, which I'll show you. And um, we have 19 new homes under construction right now. Um, in Kilburnie, uh, a suburb of Wellington. And we have uh, more importantly, some land in the pipeline to do more. So really in a, in a good position. Um, okay, so just out of my brain on what might be uh, of interest in, um, in developing our own homes. So developing is much more than building. Um, creating homes is much more than just the construction part. Um, so you have that uh, exciting construction part that we're in the midst of now, but to get there, we had to do quite a, a bit more uh, upfront work. Um, the land, uh, obviously, and the potential of the land, finding it, uh, researching what's possible to do on a piece of land, buying it, um, that's uh, no fun. <laughs> nerve wracking. Uh, and then moving on to designing what can be on the land, the homes, the gardens, the shared spaces, parking, um, taking into account sunlight, um, other important things like utilities. And um, that's where the engineers come in. Um, they make the design work. Um, they make the building stand up, be fire resistant. Um, the site work for all the different things that have to happen on the site with rubbish collection and um, safety. Uh, again, the utilities are a big part of what's possible and what's not possible, where those are coming in to your site, how they're connecting to the, to the buildings. Uh, consenting. Um, <laughs> back home in Tucson, Arizona, when I would have to um, submit our, uh, our plans and applications for what was what was called permit permits in, in Tucson. Um, we used to call the place Mordor. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> never a fun part of, uh, or 
I don't know. What you need to know is um, what can get you, what the rules are so that you're designing and planning within the rules. Your district plan um, controls what resource, uh, the resource consent, and of course the um, building code uh, controls um, building consents. And uh, then the important thing of cash and finance, so money. Money uh, is, yeah, what wakes me up in the middle of the night worrying about things, <laughs> makes the world go round. But uh, uh, dollars in your back pocket are, of course, um, the best kind of money, that cash. Uh, back in the day when um, we had a private banker, again, this is back home in Tucson, um, the private banker and my boss used to talk about how cash is king. And I was like, oh yeah, haha, ha, cash is king. But I, I really understand that now. <laughs> if you have cash, you have much more options. But for those, when you don't have cash or when you spend all your cash, you've got the finance. That's when you're asking someone to um, lend you the money and, and that's fine too. Um, that's how things get done. So being in a good position for getting finance for all the costs associated with building homes is a really important um, uh, item to line up. Uh, and that's where government support comes in handy. Uh, the government support that you're going to get, um, you have to go through an application process, sign contracts. Uh, that can be uh, quite a marathon, but having that then helps you get the finance from from the banks or the lending institutions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and how that's made a difference in some of our projects. So, um, and then the other community support um, to, make, to make it all possible. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So all those things, and then you have the construction, the construction contract, deciding who your builder is gonna be, and then going through the build process and all the exciting things that can come up during the build process. This is just my take on what um, some of the keys to um, success are with, with being a developer of your own homes. Um, one thing that makes a lot of difference is owning that land free and clear because then that counts um, as your equity, um, which the bank will um, look kindly on. So again, you're putting together your stack of uh, financing and by owning the land right there at the base, that really helps, helps your case. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, I haven't experienced anything on Maori freehold land, so I can't speak about that, but um, I know there are other speakers who have talked about that. Um, a great location, uh, really uh, a location that allows your residents uh, a great quality of life. It also affects um, kind of what you design on the site. If you're right next to a park, if you're right next to a, a transportation hub, you've got some options of maybe not um, supplying those things on your site, but having your residents um, be able to make use of those because they're right next door or nearby. So again, keeping your residents in mind, uh, building densely, of course, is uh, what we do now. I don't think we're ever gonna build a standalone home again, to be honest. Um, the land is just too important and, the, and especially the land where, again, that great location near shops, near transportation. Um, but with, with density, you need to um, consider livability and, and what I call just humanity of um, the experience of, of people living in those homes. So design, um, just can't get enough feedback and research to help um, input on the design. And you do something, you put it out there. Um, Dwell was very fortunate to, um, uh, we raised some money to do an independent research project to see how our past designs have done, and that allows us to design better next time. So just keep keeping that in mind. Um, and then, of course, the big, uh, uh, such an interesting limiting part, part of design is what your soil will allow you to do. Um, in one project we're in the planning stages of, we might have to, we were hoping for a full timber building, but we're looking like we might have to do some concrete and steel on the bottom floor. Uh, flooding, um, big one uh, for finished floor heights. Uh, fire, I, um, it's, always, <laughs> it's always a shock to me how the fire um, report um, changes design. Uh, but of course, we need to keep our families safe. We need to keep our faunas safe. And then again, the utilities, um, where they come in, where they connect. 
Uh, money, again, money having, having money before, during, and after. Um, what's great is that once the homes are done, you've got uh, money coming in either through rent or from uh, a settlement. Um, quick but thoughtful decision making. Um, it's kind of true that time is money, so you need to um, make your decisions quickly. Um, Paulo, I think what you said about everyone being on the same waka, that's really important. So you really know your purpose. You really, your decisions can be made clearly um, and, and thoughtfully and um, keeping in mind who we're building for, but also balancing that with what's possible. Sometimes what you want to do just is, isn't, can't be done. Um, and then what's really important I found is um, partners that will prioritize your work and understand your purpose. So this is the community and community housing. Um, and really there's no, there's no favors in this industry. You don't want people doing you favors. You do want people supporting you. You, you want them to bring their best to the project, to believe in your purpose, but um, you have to make sure that your partners do as well from a project as they need to do too. Just a few challenges uh, for Dwell Housing Trust specifically that some of you might not face or some of you might face. Again, we all have different mix of, of uh, who we are as an organization and what we're up against. Uh, Dwell is an independent charitable trust. So sadly, we don't have someone like a big pharma or, or Fletcher's behind us. <laughs> we're, we're on our own, doing it on our own. Um, but hey, that independent is, is, is good. Um, even though we were formed by a lot of people, um, by um, some great group of people associated with um, inner, the inner city churches here in Wellington, um, Dwell is not aligned to a church, but being aligned to a church obviously can be a great um, source of support, um, purpose. Um, I imagine it's the same when you have the support of an iwi or hapu, again, that great source of um, support and purpose for you. Now for Dwell, we have a deed of trust and a set of strategic goals that, that set that for us. Um, uh, Dwell hasn't really um, been given a lot of favors from our, our councils, our city councils. Um, they, they have their own housing to look after, of course, which in Wellington City's case is, is great. They have a wonderful um, stock of houses. Uh, they also have a special land relationship with Kaima Ora that makes um, getting land a little bit hard. So um, we don't have that you know, pipeline for rate payer money or anything. Um, but you'll see in some of our examples, the councils have been um, very helpful. Um, uh, and from government, um, the big guys, uh, their support is ever changing. Every time we go to do a project, it's a, a different team, a different funding stream, a different set of applications, new rules. Everything has to be relearned um, for every project. I feel like I'm in that Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt movie where you wake up every morning and you try again, <laughs> try to get to the end. But um, hey, keeps you on your toes and you just have to, you have to go through it. That's, that's the job. Uh, again, government support is so important, those contracts for rent um, subsidy. Uh, and there's uh, great people at government, so you just get the help you need to go through it. Um, uh, a challenge, but also what I find is a, a, a bright spark, a, a, a silver lining um, coming from the United States, uh, where charitable giving was a little bit different than his here in New Zealand. Um, I was kind of um, surprised, but not really that housing wasn't an area where people gave charitably, but of course, because the state, Kaingawara, before that housing, New Zealand would take care of it. Um, but that's changing. I think uh, every day we're bombarded with, you know, 10 different articles about the housing crisis. So I think people are beginning to recognize it is a place for um, their legacy wealth to go. And I think that's something that uh, the wealthy of this country um, can think about when leaving their legacy. And so um, I'm hopeful for that as a source of, um, of the funds to, to get homes built. Let's just um, talk a little bit about uh, the projects that, that Dwell has developed over the years. Again, our first one was at uh, Stoke in Newtown. 
uh, Dwell had, um, again, in the, in the first decades of, of Dwell purchasing existing homes to put, to renovate and have um, people live in. So this was the first one where Dwell took down uh, two old villas that were past their prime and was able to turn it into um, six lovely new warm and dry houses. So government came to the party with a small grant at, um, and then the, for those of you who remember the HIF loans, the Housing Innovation Fund, which is 25 year loan um, with the first year, uh, first 10 years interest free. So th that's again, a fantastic support for us. And then the balance um, from a bank loan. Um, again, this was a, a great first project, had all the normal teething problems. <laughs> the story of the neighbor is still told with uh, <laughs> a little bit of grumpiness around the office, but we got through that and <laughs> got that neighbor's retaining wall up. But uh, you learn a lot. You learn from your mistakes. That's something that I've, I've definitely um, benefited from, making lots of mistakes and learning from them. Um, all right, next next project then, we went on to Adelaide where, um, oh, those were the days when you could buy land off the market and not have to mortgage your firstborn. So we were able to purchase this piece of land um, and fit four four bedroom homes on it. Uh, again, government came to the party with the grant, the loan, and then the balance on the bank loan. This was really nice. We'd recognized um, for this project, the importance of the larger, uh, the larger family homes, small sites. So we had to go up three stories um, and we uh, had to and were able to put the parking on this also. So 16 new bedrooms here. Um, beautiful project, in my opinion. I'm really proud of it. Uh, Venel, now this, uh, this is a great example of where we did have a a good relationship with Wellington City Council, especially some really cool individuals um, who have now gone on to do great things in other organizations. They allowed us to purchase some surplus land from them. And um, with that came a zone change so that we could build homes. Um, before that, it was um, reserve land, so homes wouldn't be allowed to be changed. So they they changed the zoning. Uh, they uh, gave us the um, lesser of two uh, valuations. So that was nice for price. We were able to build the four homes, two rentals and two shared homeowners. So we were able to do our second round of um, our own well shared home ownership program here at Venel. And one of those homeowners has already gone to um, become 100% homeowners and the other are still working on that. But um, for those of you who listened in on um, episode seven, Allison talked about the Riverside Garden Project where we were able to cut, our, Dwell was able to cut our teeth and um, start up a shared home ownership program. And that's of course what we're excited to um, continue now that there's uh, government funding again for that. Um, so again, when you do shared home ownership, you get the proceeds from the settlement for the homeowners. So that again, helps you stack up your financing. Uh, we didn't have to borrow as much because we could um, pay down the construction loan with those proceeds from, from settlement. And then Mahora, this is where I came in for Dwell. So this will always have my heart. Um, one of the first meetings that took place was with Allison in the bank where she had to negotiate hard for some better terms. And I was just um, so impressed and that uh, uh, let the project uh, move forward. So again, Dwell owned an old uh, large villa on site um, that was basically rotting into the ground. So time to rebuild. We, um, we had the advantage of the, um, I always forget the name of this, but the, um, oh, the Special Housing Areas Act. So that allowed us to um, not have to provide as much parking on site as the district plan required. So we were able to build more homes. It also gave us the right to build higher, but we didn't take that um, because we felt the three stories was enough in the fit in the neighborhood. But um, 14 homes, all different sizes, everything from a studio to two, three bedrooms. So it's nice mixed community, lots of different ages and stages of people living there. And it really um, become a nice little micro community 
For this, we were able to get a special, or, well, at the time, um, uh, the government had allowed uh, Auckland some upfront grant money, and they just um, had decided to start allowing the rest of the country to get that. So we were in and we grabbed that. So that really helped because, again, as, as my previous slide had shown and as Paulo had talked about, there's a lot of work to do up front and all of that takes um, skill and time. And so you have to pay for that, um, the design, the engineering, all of that. So that upfront grant is just a, a fabulous way to get a project off the ground, um, supported on the back end by um, what we had as a 15 year contract to receive the income related rent subsidy. So we could take that to the bank. They could see that we were going to have no problem um, getting the cash flow, the income from rent, uh, for those 15 years. And so we were able to settle on, on the bank loan after some tough negotiation by Allison. <laughs> and that allowed us to move forward. Um, we also had a little bit of a gap that was filled by um, two private loans from supportive donors. So we're very grateful for that. Again, the community in community housing. Um, so that's in Kilburnie. Across the street, that's where we've started our next one. So again, um, the community and community housing, uh, a piece of land was found by our builder, Wilson Building at uh, Mahora, and um, they were so keen to do another project with us. They said, let us, you know, let's let's get this piece of land. So that was great um, for them to go find that and do the negotiations. And then we were also able to um, go to foodstuffs um, and buy their lot because there's the pack and save right there. And so they sold us that at valuation, so off the market. So just an incredible um, support from foodstuffs um, and, and from a builder that allowed us um, to get this, this L-shaped site. Um, uh, by the time we were ready, uh, government had changed their mind and decided no more upfront uh, grants. Um, but we had seen that coming and we started a divestment program where we, um, we divested three of our old homes. So basically we're rebuilding um, a number of bedrooms from those old homes and, and um, in a much better location also. So yeah, but on the backside, without the upfront money, on the backside government now offers not only income related rent subsidy, but the operating subsidy, so a little bit more for us. And for that, we um, have just signed a 25-year contract. So again, taking that to the bank to get the financing really puts us in a solid um, position with cash flow income. So that's, um, that's what's on my plate now, making sure that that goes smoothly. It's so nice, as you can see from our the picture that we're out of the ground. When you're in the ground, you find all sorts of um, funny surprises. Um, <laughs> we found an unmarked sewer line from the the neighbor's house that we then had to reroute. And um, but you know, um, surprises are surprises. You just uh, put your thinking cap on and and deal with them, and hope it doesn't cost too much more money. <laughs> Cut into your contingency. Key takeaways. Um, so for me, it, it's a long, strange journey. Um, these things never go straightforward. Like I say, I um, make a lot of mistakes you learn from and you just, again, pick yourself up and um, make the best decision you can to move forward. But um, it's really is made bearable by by friends and, and, the, and the partners you have. And when you're able to celebrate the families moving into the homes, it's, it's all worth it. And um, yeah, that keeps me going. Um, Dwell is here because a few people took um, took that first step. I know that uh, people say development uh, is hard, it's risky. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but, uh, you know, if it's right, be bold and take that step and, and be a developer. And over time, uh, growth is possible. Uh, that's Dwell's story. And um, we're really, we're really quite proud of it. I'm really quite proud to be a part of it. So I'll just, uh, I'll leave you with that if there's any questions. Oh, kia ora, Ingrid. Fantastic. I just um, wanted to note too that I'm now a neighbour of your Stoke Street development in Newtown and my kids go to school with the kids who live there and we often are walking in a 
big walking bus down to Newtown School. So, um, you know, I hope I'm a, a pl- more pleasant neighbour, perhaps, <laughs> than what you <laughs> seem to have previously experienced. <laughs> hey, look, don't talk to me about your retaining wall. I don't. No, no, it's not retaining. ours. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, so, look, I just I really noted from your presentation there the importance of relationships. So. Uh, a, a key question that kind of summarizes some of the questions that are coming through in the Q&A, which is what, what could we ask of the government um, or other funding partners to better support the community sector as developers? Yeah, um, that's a good question because like my presentation talked about how much ha- uh, changes. Um, there's loans, there's grants, there's no loans, there's no grants, there's backup money. I think... Um, Having having making a decision and sticking with it, having some steady, um, giving us all a chance to understand and plan, knowing what kind of funding is going to be in the future is is probably the the number one. Um, but regardless of that, uh, you know those relationships with your with your people at at HUD, um, at Tipuna Kokori, um, people through the Maihi project, those are going to be your most important ones. And um, take it from me, uh, you know, there are, there really are no dumb questions. You just need to ask. Um, you need to make sure you understand. But yeah, um, some stability in the funding area would be would be fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Ingrid. And I know there's um, a few more questions really specific to you in the chat coming through, but I might leave you to answer those as we move into into Nick's presentation. So thank you very much again. And uh, welcome to Nick Green from Habitat for Humanity. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Nick Green, tāko ingoa, nō kiri kiri roa aho. And uh, yeah, Morina Fano. great to be here today, just going to speak uh, about Habitat for Humanity and um, some of our lessons learned around, around the build process. Um, so Habitat is, a, is an international organisation, I guess the other end of the spectrum from what Ingrid's been talking about, been around for um, over 30 years now and building you know, hundreds of thousands of houses uh, across the globe. Um, in New Zealand, that's around 600 houses in the last 25 years. And, and most of you who know Habitat will know that it's been in the progressive home ownership uh, sort of space for, uh, for whānau looking to enter that, uh, that home ownership uh, cycle. Um, and most of those have been uh, what I'm going to term self-build, so the things we've kind of run ourselves in that development space, um, but we have uh, looked to expand recently into uh, more rental properties, um, mainly to diversify the portfolio and looking to serve people across uh, the much wider um, housing continuum. So I guess, you know, prior to 2018, a lot of the houses um, that we were building um, were very small single house units on site. Some of those were um, subdivisions, buy a house, subdivide the back section, uh, do some infill. It was low volume. Um, So for us, that central region, um, you know, less than 10 houses a year, uh, you know, to to get the outcomes we're looking for. Um, our model was mainly using uh, construction staff, both people we employed ourselves and some externals, um, but also homeowners, so the people who are eventually going to own those houses, and a lot of volunteers. Um, and, and so, you know, had lots of people on site uh, doing things and engaging with Habitat. And as we've seen already from the, from the guys who've spoken, you know, there's a number of stages uh, in that process. Uh, from you know, from site acquisition through the design and consenting right through to pl- practical completion, um, and that brings with it its own special set of uh, of challenges. Post twenty eighteen, you know, things changed a little bit, and I guess what I want to talk about for the rest of this presentation is kind of like what are the options that you have um, available to you when you're looking to do a build, looking to do a development yourself. Uh, so what changed was um, some of the compliance requirements. So health and safety became a more significant uh, set of legislative requirements. Having volunteers on site um, is now very, very difficult. And, uh, and the risks that go with that mean that nobody really wants to uh, sort of you know, open themselves up to that kind of risk. And it was also about changes to build guarantee and the quality of finish. You can imagine 20 volunteers in your lounge painting it. You can't really guarantee the, um, the, the type of finish we're going to get. Um, we also had a strong desire to go to scale, and going to scale is difficult unless you're willing to invest in spe- uh, specialist staff 
and you need to have a decent um, supply pipeline to justify that, those stuff. Lots of risk settings, and there's been a session on risk, um, and also change in funding settings and real uh, totoku to uh, what's been said already. You know, some some surety around funding um, is is essential uh, to understanding what your um, what your build looks like, and because these things do take time. And I think finally, there was a recognition from Habitat that our specialist skills weren't necessarily in construction, but they were in other areas. And so, um, you know, we, we wanted to maximise those without sort of becoming a construction company. So there are some benefits to this, you know, self-managing your own build. You've got, you're in total control. You can save costs, you can make profit in the development if you manage it really well. But there's also a bunch of cons as well. And I think when we balance the two things up, what we decided was um, the cons overwhelm the pros to some extent, um, unless you are really, really clear about what it was you were trying to achieve and how you were going to get through that, um, that process. And so those things are listed down there um, very clearly about the, the idea that we need to um, focus on the, on the outcomes we're looking for. What we did uh, as a next step uh, for Habitat was we entered into a, an agreement to uh, do 12 houses in a place called Te Kareria, um, in Hamilton City um, with Waikato Tainui and with Golden Homes as our build partner. So this is us stepping away from just doing one house at a time, stepping away from being solely responsible for the build and moving more into a contract build space. So a little bit about like what Paul was speaking about, you know, who are you partnering with and how do you manage those outcomes? And in this, uh, in this development, uh, there were 50 something houses and um, it was a master plan development under the special housing area. So it had all the, the various moving parts. And we came in literally as a partner to buy property uh, to house families. There were 300 families that went through Waikato Tainui's home ownership education program. And the idea was that they would take those families, those graduates, and put them into housing, um, some of them into housing in Card area. And what we found was that um, you know, a shared equity model worked for some. An affordable straight to market model worked for some, but there were others who those wouldn't work for and a rent to buy model was the, the model that was needed. And so Habitat came in as the provider of the rent to buy model for those 12 houses that are coloured purple and yellow. Um, and, and I guess the upside of that was um, that we were able to finish those and those families are now all moved in um, and ready for Christmas. So yeah, lots of whare, lots of um, whanau, all, uh, all happy uh, for Christmas. The key um, parts of this that were important, I suppose, from our perspective was that we, we selected a really strong build partner. So to, um, Golden Homes were really uh, the, the deliverer of the product. Um, we worked really closely with MHUD to, um, to fund the project and we made sure our funding was lined up um, in advance. And uh, so MHUB were able to fund 50% of the capital cost and then the other 50% came from, from bank lending. Um, so we were really clear about where the funding was coming from and how it would be applied. And then you know, our speciality is really in the selection of the families. And so we were able to work with Waikato Tainui and say, let's look at the 300 families that you've got there. Let's go through a selection process and let's identify those families who we can select for success um, to put into these homes under the rent to buy model that Habitat is going to deliver. And, one, and uh, Waikato Tainui had a person on our um, selection panel so that they were able to sit in those interviews and work through with the families about you know, what the, the nature of that relationship is going to look like because our rent to buy model is a 10 year partnership. Um, and yeah, we walk with those families over that entire period of time. The pros of the contract build are, you know, you've got some design input, but but not a whole amount. This was a master planned community. So we weren't able to change the, the, the um, dwellings themselves, but we did have some control over color schemes and those kind of things. It had a fixed contract price, um, you know, no in delivery timelines and pretty easy to scale. Um, you know, talking, go back to my idea about scaling. You know, if you're doing a contract build, you can, you can forecast what you're looking for. The cons, of course, are lim more limited input um, there's a lot of project monitoring stuff that's required for staff still. So, you know, you've got to, you're the piggy in the middle. You've got MHUD on one end with all of their expectations around reporting, and you've got um, the contractors on the other end and the families, and you're trying to negotiate and um, facilitate good outcomes on the way through. So you still need to really know, what, know, know your stuff, know what you're doing. And the biggest issue is that um, cash flow may not necessarily um, match the funding 
um, requirements that you have as an organisation. So just as an example of, of what happens is that under the contract, um, the drawdown milestones didn't necessarily line up between government and, um, and the builder itself. And so you can see that basically um, MHA's definition of closed in and the builder's definition of sheathed and when the drawdown milestones are required don't line up. And so you need working capital and you need to be really clear about that. Even though the whole project was funded at 100%, um, we still had an $85,000 shortfall um, at a part of the project. And so going to these things with your eyes wide open about how the process is going to work, how the contract works, and then how you're going to monitor that um, is, is an essential part of, um, of the build process. What we've done um, as an organisation is now looked at it and said, if we, you know, that contract build is one way of doing it. Have we got the working capital? Does that, uh, does that enable us to manage this? Or is there another way to do it? And a turnkey approach is another way. And so the latest round of funding that we have uh, for 21 houses that we were successful in the um, October round, um, these are all turnkey properties. And the, the benefit of that, of course, is that um, you pay 10% up front and then you don't pay anything else until the house is finished. It's a little bit more expensive because you're paying um, the builder to cover that cost and cover the, um, the risk. Um, but from a cash flow perspective, it makes life significantly easier um, on, on our, own, um, our own finances. The pros, of course, there are that you have, again, some design input. You get to choose colour schemes, um, but, uh, but depending on the acquisition timing, so how early you are in that process, um, you, you have limited uh, input. You have less project monitoring required. Um, it's a fixed contract build price. <laughs> well, it was then. I think these things are becoming less possible because of the way the, the climate's moving. Um, but, uh, but, you know, limited control over the price um, and then no one delivery timeframes. I kind of, it's a little bit like fire and forget. You, you buy the house um, and then you get it when it's, uh, when it's finished. Um, the downsides are, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a higher upfront cost, absolutely more expensive, um, limited input. Um, and limited engagement um, in the process. But um, I don't know, well, if that there's a con, but the cash flow does match the funding, so it, is, it does work better. The key takeaways that I really wanted to leave everybody with was, um, was being really clear about your desired outcomes. And I think both the previous speakers have talked about this. Um, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Who are you looking to serve? And then managing the expectations of everyone. And it's essential that the, you understand the needs of Fano what they're looking for, and then how you're going to get there and being really clear about that. The biggest thing is expectation management. The second one is about choosing good partners. So making sure that you are really aligned in your vision and that you've done your due diligence because you know the flashiest person with the glossiest brochures isn't necessarily the best partner to have, especially when things get difficult, and they will. There'll be times during the process where things are hard and you need to be able to fall back on that relationship and fall back on your understandings and your contracts rather than, you know, that oh, I thought this was the case. And finally, understanding your own capacity and competency. Um, don't be afraid to say that we're not good at that. So don't leap into a project thinking we're going to build it, we're going to deliver it, um, when building and delivery is, aren't your strong points. Habitat is good at selecting families and supporting families. Construction wasn't our necessarily our strong point. Understand your own unique value proposition. And, uh, and surround yourself with partners that complement your weaknesses. Um, that's, uh, that, that's probably the, the size of my presentation. Um, so Kirby, thanks very much. Oh, kia ora, Nick. Um, so your presentation for me really underscored four key themes that I think have run through all our presentations. And those are whānau, communication, stability and alignment of funding, strong relationships and play to your strengths. Um, so they've, they've really cropped up for me time and time again. I'm just wondering, though, specifically to you, what's been um, your biggest challenge when it comes to the construction process itself? When you're in the middle of getting these things, you know, built in and choosing those colours, what, what crops up as the biggest challenge during that part of the process? Um, it really is expectation management. I think everything else um, you, you can kind of work your way through. But, you know, we've had situations you, you, I commonly get that oh, I thought. And, um, and, you know, it's really managing people and going really clearly, here's your specification list. Here's the things you're going to get in the house. Here's the things that aren't going to be in the property. And so that's from a family um, whānau perspective. Um, and then from a build contractor perspective, really make, being able to say, hey, guys, this is this is the 
what we agreed to, here's what we need you to deliver, and also understanding, I suppose, um, who carries the big stick. Um, in, the, in this case, and you know, I know Imhad are on the call, um, Imhad carry the big stick, right? They're the ones that are the, the least negotiable um, around a lot of these things. And so understanding that and going, well, we can't change the nature of those drawdowns. And so we've just got to manage our way through it. Um, you know, that, that's the biggest, uh, that's been our biggest hurdle. And I constantly find myself um, in the middle with my role sort of saying to people, um, yep, I, I, I understand that's what you thought, but here's the reality of the situation. Thanks, Nick. And um, I think a question that probably um, I can ask all of you, if we could start with you, Nick, and then move to you, Ingrid and Paula, is what you look for in a partner entity. What are those key things that you look for when you are choosing those partners and, and kind of building those strong relationships? So, Nick, if you could start us off, that would be great. Sure. Um, two things, um, really. One is um, alignment and principles. So, you know, really getting to know the partner and making sure that you agree those fundamental things about who you are as an organization. Our discussions with Golden Homes um, were very much about why, the why. Why are we doing this? You know, they can be the greatest builders in the world, but if they don't understand why we're housing the whanau, then actually when things get hard and they want to make a change, um, you know, you, you, the, the principles don't line up. And then the second thing is the complementary skill set. So you know, understand your own weaknesses, and then find a partner that plugs into those weaknesses. It's no good. Um, I'm, a, I'm a talker, right? So it's no good having a whole bunch of people around the table who are all talkers um, and no doers. So find the people um, that will add value to your, um, to your project. Go to Nick Ingrid. Yeah, absolutely, Nick. Very well said. Um, those are the foundational um, uh, considerations for sure. I would also just add that, in, especially in this time of COVID and um, weird supply chains, um, uh, a builder uh, who can um, really command uh, uh, materials <laughs> and has good relationships with material suppliers, has uh, land or space where they can store materials for you. <laughs> That's um, become very important on this project. Uh, all the materials are ordered, you know, much, much earlier now, um, which means they have to be stored and secured. Um, so that kind of power within um, within the industry to do that, uh, the ability to get on the phone and um, place those orders, have those orders taken seriously and, and, and honored. Um, and then, so that's just a, a, a little one for now, but um, communication is really important. Someone who really, really wants you to understand what's going on and why. Um, and we'll have those hard conversations with you. Like I said, we don't want anyone to do us favors necessarily. Um, we want them to support us. We want them to understand. And there's just really some great moments when, you know, kind of the pennies dropped for the builders and they, they really see what they're creating when they see the families, you know, some great stories there, but um, we really want them to tell us their truth. Um, so we can work with them really honestly and on the level. Kia ora and Grace. Paula. Yeah, just really um, supporting um, Ingrid and Nick. I think, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the front end stuff is, is vital uh, in terms of setting the platform. You know, you talked about laying the foundation at the beginning of the uh, webinar so very very important uh, relationships very key to a successful outcome um, in business in and dealing talking with Fano key stakeholders you know you're not building you're not looking for best price necessarily we all know best price isn't sometimes the best pathway so so don't make your decisions purely based on price base it on a long-term relationship. Obviously, sometimes we're building one house, so that's um, a little bit harder, but yeah, I would, that's one thing I would, I would say is don't, don't base your uh, decisions on, on a price solely model. Um, yeah, Kilda. Kilda. So 
I'd just like you all to have a chance to just leave us with your final thoughts, um, perhaps a wrap up of, of, of the key messages that you'd like everyone to take away, and then I'll close us um, with a cut of care. But, but maybe if we work backwards this time, Paula, from you, um, what, what's your final reflection to leave everybody with? Um, it's difficult, you know, it's difficult out there at the moment. Um, Ingrid mentioned COVID um supply and that so planning planning and nick mentioned planning so planning is the key planning is the key to a successful over plan over budget you know um and then at the end overindulge so um on all the good things <laughs> so taku tō i te tō taki tahi, engari taku tō i te tō taki tini. so you know, you can't do it on your own. It takes a wide range and of people and skills. So, kia ora. Kia ora. Ingrid, your last reflections. Oh, lovely. Um, I, I guess what's on my mind uh, more than anything is um, when you're a developer, you get a chance to have, you know, be in the driver's seat and develop the housing that you really want to see exist. And um, I think that's really special. It also can kind of do a trick on your mind because you question everything. And so I just want to uh, make a plug for all those um, people out there who are researching uh, housing, um, all the people who are sharing their insights on what makes good housing, um, our tenants, um, just love them. They're able to give us really good feedback. Sometimes I don't want to hear it. Uh, but I think that, um, I mean, none of us have a, a, our own perfect house, but the chance to develop the kind of housing that uh, the people of New Zealand need is, is, is a really great opportunity. And, and I'm just really thankful we have that, that feedback loop and just encourage you all to, you know, keep talking about what makes good humane housing. Well, kia ora, Ingrid. I think that the idea of humane housing certainly is, is one that we think about a lot here at Community Housing Aotearoa, <laughs> certainly. Nick? Yeah, thanks. And really just um, agree with uh, Paul and Ingrid about you know, what, what they've said. Um, the key thing for me is that housing is for a long time. You know, they, these properties that we're putting up are going to be here for generations. So let's do it right first and uh, you know, sort of do it well. Um, and secondly, that it's about the people, the whanau who are going to live there. It's not about the building itself. And so let's make sure that you know, we're creating um, homes for people to live in um, rather than just fuddy. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think that's, that's the, really the key. Um, I, and it was great listening to everybody when you, you, know, you look at those things and Ingrid was effusive about, you know, that was her first pro project, that's her baby. You know? I think we all want to drive back onto the whenua and be proud of what we've produced. What a great way to finish. Thank you all for joining us for this episode of Te Ahota Huhu, uh, Managing the Build. I am going to close us off with a karakia. Ko mutua mato mahi mo tene wa manaki te mai mato kato o mato ho o mato fano ayo kita aurangi. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely holiday break, and I hope to see more of you in person in the new year. Kia ora, Ingrid. Kaki te.